As crazy as that sounds, and as much fun as I've made of that guy, and how much I just can't stand his like deadpan look. I just can't stand his face sometimes. But I know, he very looks. <laughs> he, he's got that look on his face like my dad wouldn't like that. Yeah, he's got a very punchable face. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Formula Breakdown. We are on the highway to the Australian Grand Prix. Wouldn't it be a boat? A boat. Yeah, I guess there's no highway to Australia. Yeah, it would be a boat. So we're on a plane, we're on a boat, we're on a barge, we're in an F1 car, but we're on the way to round three. Man, Caleb, how are you feeling about the Australian Grand Prix? I'm excited for it. I'm excited for an actual race. I think last week, kind of, or well, two weeks ago, feels like last week, kind of, bummed everybody out with all the FIA issues and everything like that. And I'm just ready to move on and get another, hopefully another week's worth of drama and fun stuff to talk about. Yeah, but you had some racing this weekend. Like you, you, you follow NASCAR pretty closely yeah. and you saw some familiar faces at the circuit of the Americas, right? Yeah, that was exciting. We got to see old Gunther in the booth. So that was interesting. He was kind of a little bit out of his element, but I mean, it's kind of weird having a, a European person in the booth in an American booth. It was interesting to get some of his takes and him getting to give some insight because in NASCAR, they refuel. And in Formula One, we don't refuel during races. So it was interesting kind of hearing his point of view of strategy compared to some of the NASCAR guys point of view of strategy. And then also all the bumping and banging that was going on. Not not very finesse driving on road courses, at least. They were they were at a road course this week. So it was uh it was interesting. We got to see Kimmy race this week and we got to see Button. He was in there racing. Uh some people may know Jordan Taylor. He does more of the twenty four hours of like Daytona and Lamar, that kind of sports car driving so he was racing so that's kind of what you get with nascar during the road races is kind of get some of these wild cards these these ringers that come in from you know other ventures whether it be formula one or kind of like the normal road course racing they kind of will do maybe a race here and there so it's it's always interesting to see those guys Kimmy was up to fourth at one point during the end of the race, but it's such a, those road races at NASCAR are just bumping and banging and it's, there's a lot of, um, variables. It's not the normal racing that you'd normally see with F1 or really even like sports car racing. It was, it was fun to watch. Formula One's definitely more interesting to watch. Granted there's, cause there's no commercial breaks and there's like a million during NASCAR. So yeah, we're very lucky here in the States to have F1 TV and not have to like watch it through a contracted sport sports channel that's shoving ads down your throat so you can definitely see nascar trying to imitate a lot of things that that f1 is doing currently because i think i would be in the majority here saying that f1 is probably the premier racing media in the world right now i would agree did gunther have any thoughts about like track limits and how cars were just all over the place it's such a different type of racing that he's not used to seeing week to week really yeah i didn't catch any of his comments on that like i said he didn't really talk that much the booth had four people there this That's week so it's a lot of people and him being new and not really knowing those guys from what i understand at least he might have known some of them but it didn't seem like it. it's kind of hard you know you just meet these people and you're trying to it's hard to interject in between these professionals that broadcast and cover nascar every week you know what they should have done they should have put him like track side pat mcafee style yeah um with somebody else like i don't know ricardo or, or somebody hilarious and just had him shouting over the cars like driving past the other side of the barricade that would be hilarious yeah. it, it was uh it was nice to at least have a, a familiar f1 face in the booth and some familiar f1 drivers on the grid right on well i'm glad you got some racing in this weekend and then this coming weekend we've got the australian grand prix you know there's been a few things in the news not a ton but one of the things was again lewis hamilton made some newsworthy comments i feel like really anytime lewis says anything it becomes newsworthy and i guess that's what happens when you win seven world championships and so, some would say eight plenty of people do he actually gets introduced a lot of places as an eight-time world champion it happened today he got introduced as the eighth world time champion and i don't know if it's like them being funny I don't know. If you're Lewis, how do you feel about that? Do you just laugh it off or do you like get offended or do you just, I don't know. I'm not sure how yeah, I would feel about I that. I would roll my eyes. Because say whatever you want. The guy earned seven outright and he, like you could retire tomorrow and he'd be in the conversation for the greatest of all time forever. But when people make a joke, 
out of it? I don't know. Does that lessen you? I, I, me personally, I don't think I would like it. I would hate people saying it's it's in the past. Let's 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 move on. Like let's get over it. I'm a wrestling fan, and there's one of the best wrestlers ever was Bret Hart, and so many people focus on how he left the WWE. 30 years ago, he was kind of screwed and and politic. And so many people focus on that. And it's a shame when people focus on the thing you didn't get to do after you worked so hard and earned so much outright the right way. So I don't know. Um, But Hamilton was in the news talking about the RB19 saying we weren't that fast. I think it's the fastest car I've seen, especially compared to the rest. I don't know how or why, but Max came past me with some serious speed. I didn't even bother to block because it was just a massive speed difference. And of course he was talking about Max making his way through the field and just kind of whizzing past him without much effort. So uh, what are you thinking about those comments? And do you agree or disagree? He has obviously said that in frustration and Hamilton's no historian. I mean, I'm sure he is, but in the moment, you know, you're going to say something. So I think his words are probably being taken out of, not out of context, but out of frustration But you've got all these Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes fans that I just can't stand. I'm a Red Bull fan, but I won't disagree with them that we did go over budget last year. And the championship Max won the first time was interesting, to say the least. The Mercedes from like 2014 to 2016, it won 51 out of the 59 races. And that was back before the budget caps. So you could really spend... However much, I don't know how much money Mercedes spent. I wish I had that figure on hand, but it was probably a lot when other teams just couldn't afford that. I'm not trying to justify Red Bull overspending. They shouldn't have overspent on, you know, all that catering. But that Mercedes of that time was so fast. I mean, they that, that's 86% of the races that they won. I don't think it's all that true. It's not, it is a fast car, but I think Mercedes is just that slow this year. If Red Bull had the car that they had at the start of last year, they would still be faster than a Mercedes that's been developed for two years now. That Mercedes is just terrible. Uh, For Mercedes standards, it's terrible. Yeah, no, I... uh I kind of lean back on my comments before. I think these things come in dynasties, and I think we're in the Red Bull dynasty. And my thought is, is the cost cap going to lengthen that? Is that going to inhibit other teams' ability to move up the ranks? Like, if there was no cost cap, where would Aston Martin be today, as opposed to where they're at right now, which is way far up the order, but... If Aston Martin hadn't had a budget cap, is it possible they'd be even further up the grid fighting competitively for first place? It just, it's worth bringing up that like Red Bull is probably where they are regardless of any kind of cost cap or any kind of infringement of that 2023. But I don't know. my, My question is, is this budget cap really leveling the playing field like everyone thought it was? You could say, oh, well, look at Aston Martin. But it could also be a double edged sword. Did the cost cap help Aston Martin jump up the grid this season or did it really hinder them? The last time that I, at least me personally, can remember like budget caps and things like that is in Major League Baseball. Back when the Yankees were winning everything, there wasn't a budget cap. They could buy who they wanted. And then you, and they did, did, and they won a lot of championships, a lot of World Series. And then the budget cap comes around and it leveled the playing field. And I, I don't have it offhand, but Yankees haven't won World Series in a while. So you can look at it like that. You know, Yankees are basically the Mercedes of before budget caps happened. It's just unfortunate that this story came out about Red Bull at the tail end of last season, and they just happened to be the team that was dominating. And now they're dominating even more the season thereafter. If it was any other team, they'd say, well, uh, you know, Haas went over the budget cap. Well, no. I mean, they're still in seventh place, so what's the big deal? But it had to be the team that was in first. Yeah. So, and I hate it too because it unfortunate. It really puts a bad mark on what is potentially a an, an amazing another amazing car designed by Adrian Newey. I mean, he's got eleven constructors championships, five of them with Williams, five of them with Red Bull, and one with McLaren. Those are cars he designed. Got twelve drivers championships, six of them being with Red Bull. So it's not like Red Bull overspent and that's how they're magically faster. They have a freaking wizard back there designing cars and running the whole design portion of their uh, their department. So, and this isn't the first time Adrian Newey's had a dominant car. The Williams, the FW14B, that was that car was 1.5% faster 
than the closest competition. I forgot which year that was, but that's like one of my favorite cars. And this year, the or last year, the Red Bull was only 0.3% faster than the rest of the field. So mm. he, there's been times where we've just seen cars that are just flat out more dominant. And you've, you've got this one guy that's really behind a lot of them at least in recent history. It sucks because if you haven't read Adrian Newey's book to our listeners, they, they need to listen to it. It's it's great. It's just a really cool insight on the design of Formula One cars, whether you, whether you like Red Bull or not. It's a really interesting insight and kind of the background on how things were done way back when with pen and paper. He's always got something. He's always got a pen in his yep. hand. Right <laughs> always making notes. Yeah. But anyways, long story short, I, I think Mercedes fans just need to stop crying and just make their car better. Well, now that we're talking about guys behind the scenes, um, some news came out this week that David Sanchez is going to be going to McLaren at the start of next year. Lots of news coming out of McLaren, of course. Things are looking a little rough over there. We've talked about that some. Some redistribution of roles. And I kind of got a lot of people thinking, is this going to be a real trog through the mud for them to even bounce back? Are they going to become another team? A backmarker like Williams. What's Zach Brown's future? The McLaren CEO. Caleb, what are you thinking about this news coming out of McLaren after a couple of really rough weekends? Yeah, I think it's good news. David Sanchez had... You know, he yeah, he got sacked from Ferrari, but they have a better car than McLaren has had in the past couple of years. So that should be interesting. McLaren's also kind of had a shakeup in their leadership in general. They've kind of restructured it. Some of that's happening this year. Some of that's happening next year. Uh, like you said, Sanchez isn't able to actually go to McLaren until the 1st of January of next year. So it'll be interesting to see. I hope McLaren figure something out i really hope they do good this week especially with it being piastri's you know his home race we got the new australian or the new aussie i guess you'd say on the grid so hopefully he does well we me and you both like mclaren we we raced as them on f122 so they're kind of one of my other favorite teams and i think it's one of your favorite teams as well like lando i've said that a million times lando's a great driver huge upside you could put him i think you could put lando in on any any car in the grid and he could make it yeah he's just I really do. He's had bad luck this year. This move makes sense. Like, he's got experience with McLaren. That's kind of where he cut his yes. teeth. So, it seems like a natural fit. Yeah, and he was with McLaren when they were winning championships, winning races. It should be should be a good thing. Hopefully, McLaren can get back in form and get back to that McLaren of old. And hopefully, Lando isn't just wasting his talents away driving that orange tractor around the, around, yeah, around the field, around the uh, track. <laughs> Last round, we saw Checo bring home a victory at another uh, street circuit in Saudi Arabia. Do you think he's actually got a, ch- a chance at winning this world title? I think he does. I think for at least for our sake, if it keeps going like this, I hope him and Max go back and forth. I mean, wouldn't you agree? I think he's the only one who's got a shot. Yeah. And if if he really wants to sit around and defend for Max for a grid that's 20 to 30 seconds behind, I think that speaks to the kind of driver he is. And I don't think that's the kind of driver he is. This guy paid his dues in some mediocre teams, thought his career was almost over, thought his career was over. And then he came back in a winning car and now he's got a setup that works for him. If he doesn't push all out then he's a fool and i don't think he came here to win second so i'm really hoping for a hamilton rossberg a vettel weber style season where they just go tooth and nail i really want to see it come down to them i would if if we ended the season with checo as the driver's champion i think that would catch everybody off guard i think it'd be good for the sport i think it'd be good for red bull show like look we're not a one horse race yeah. you know so many teams have a one-two who like a, a driver who's clearly the favorite a driver who clearly is the leader of the team how badass would it be for red bull to say actually both of our drivers are world champions what now how many teams have two world champions almost none of them not not two that are well let me think yeah not two that are both active on the same exact team haven't seen that for you know several years i mean because you've got the lewis hamilton winning so many in a row but still it would be interesting because because checo still has another year on his contract after this one i think his is up in 2024 so he's still there he's going to be there next year and i think for him he needs to stay where he's at you know he needs to be still winning races if he ever gets behind or has a dnf or becomes where he's like 40 points behind max or something like that i think that's when you're gonna see red bull be like okay well putting all the cards 
in Max's favor. You know, I think Checo just, he has to keep this momentum going. He can't slow down in order to win this championship. That's a great point because they're going to be looking for any reason to say, hey, Checo, this season isn't going to work out for you. So let's make sure we get Max there you know, to keep the vultures in second and third at bay. So, but I mean, it'd be really exciting for us as fans to at least have that competitive back and forth between the two. It it hurts. And it's, it's weird. Cause like me being a Red Bull fan, it's like, Oh gosh, now I, you know, you're kind of like gritting your teeth. Like don't crash into each other. Don't crash into each other. No, you don't want all this team dynamics going, you know, out the, out the door. So, but again, it'll make it for a much more interesting season. And I like Checo. I love it when teammates race. I love it. Let them race. It's, a freaking race who's the fastest i hope we see it and and you know speaking of crashes and stuff and the potential for crashes there's been some rumor and some comments from f1 ceo that maybe they want to take free practice away as like an event as like a third day of uh, the formula one weekend what are your thoughts about potentially drivers having less time on track in their vehicles i think it would make it more interesting at the same time As a fan, like Friday practice, I could sometimes care less. And also on practices that aren't at the same time that either qualifying or the race is at, almost seems pointless. Like when they're practicing at Saudi Arabia during the day. It's like what I know you're getting information for for the car and you're figuring things out. But what are you really figuring out that's going towards the race? Because the race is at night. Temperatures are cooler. Tracks cooler. It's a whole different track. And but you're going to practice during the day when it's hot and sunny and the track slick and you're probably going to, you know, crash. I understand what he's saying. Uh, on the flip side, it's like, OK, do we at the same time? I like watching practice on Fridays because it gives me one more day of something to watch one more day of f1 so it's kind of a double-edged sword wouldn't you agree i think i'd be cool with it getting retooled and i don't necessarily think it needs to go away in a complete sense yeah like maybe you don't need three practices maybe it doesn't have to be an event that you sell tickets to maybe it's a closed thing and it's optional you don't have to send your car out on track and maybe it's only allotted during the exact same time as the race is going to be happening to get exact scenario basically of when the race is going to be taking place like maybe there's only one free practice on thursday and one free practice on friday and it's at the same time as the grand prix will be maybe it doesn't need to be you know a a third day of f1 and maybe that would allow more people to come to the actual qualifying day and grand prix and, and stuff like that yeah i like the idea of having one maybe one practice that because usually qualifying is usually the same roundabout time as the actual race is not always but most of the time it is. So it'd be interesting to have one practice, one qualifying, one race. And then on sprint weekends, you still just throw a sprint in there. So you get a practice, a sprint, or a practice qualifying sprint in the race. I, I'm agreeing with you. Like, I don't think taking, I don't think you should take practice out of it completely. It still needs to be there 100%. You having three practices, that's a lot. I think it could be routine. Yeah, I think it could be too. It's not a terrible idea. And I'm sure he probably said that off the cuff. And now he's like, oh God, what did I do? It's been a slow news <laughs> yeah. week. Yeah, I'm sure he's kicking himself in the ass right now. Like, why did I open my mouth this week? Well, yeah, that's, I mean, we'll have to keep an eye out on that. They're making a lot of changes, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some changes to that at some point. Man, just a few days away from the Australian Grand Prix. Who do you think takes pole this year on uh, Saturday? And so this track now has, they've confirmed it's going to have four DRS zones this year. So we are we are going pod racing. It is going to be fast. And it's a fast track already. They took out that little chicane on the back stretch uh, a, a couple God. years ago. So I knew that like through me and you through kind of a loop because we were playing F1 2018 and they had that chicane in there and then we're playing 22 and it's, it's you know it's a different track a little bit and so you're like oh okay this is different i think it fucked me up <laughs> it fucked me up every time man yeah it hated that thing so it's going to be a very fast track and fast tracks lend their hand towards your good buddies red bull but this has been historically a a ferrari dominant track so who do you see putting in p1 the fastest lap in qualifying through i mean max okay. <laughs> is that a surprise <laughs> it's a safe bet but it's it's like, a safe bet it's it's i mean really like it has to be max well it was charles last year charles who so often last year was mr saturday who could hook it up for one lap right at the end of qualifying and then that damn race had to happen yeah you know? 
If we were giving out points and qualifying, Charles Leclerc would be your F1 champion of 2022. But yeah, I mean, I can't even disagree. I think we made the joke when we were talking about Saudi Arabia that we're just going to predict Max until he stops winning. But yeah, I think it's it's going to be another, and barring mechanical failure again, it's Max's pole. But it doesn't matter what happens on Saturday, it matters what happens on Sunday. So who do you see on the podium this year? This year, I, I'm hoping that, I'm pretty sure Max probably win i know this is boring i'm not gonna go out there on a limb on anything i think we're probably gonna see potentially the same podium hopefully officially that we've seen the past couple races and then i you know i'm kind of leaning towards maybe this track being so fast being in australia it's during the day temps are going to be high engine temps are going to be high so i think we are going to see some some kind of failures when it comes to engine that's what happened to max last year so i i I, it's it's hard to predict really but i think it's max and checo and then hopefully our good buddy alonzo i i want to see him win a race but i just want to keep this string of third places I, I like seeing him on the podium i think it's it's awesome seeing him up there yeah i mean that's a safe bet i can't fault you for that um worth noting last year's podium charles actually won that race back when 2022 still seemed like it was going to be a competitive interesting entertaining season sergio perez took second and in his first ever podium with mercedes george russell took home the bronze in third i actually have a little bit more out there prediction walk with me here i think it's going to be a red bull front row on saturday and I think something's going to happen in the first few turns. And Max, maybe he goes wide. Maybe something happens. I think the, the podium at the end of the race is going to be Checo winning Red Bull's first race in Australia since Sebastian Vettel in 2011. And then, this is where it's going to get a little wild, Alonso second. And I think Stroll's going to get third. Oh. I, think Str- I, think, I think Stroll is on his way. I think he just needs right scenario. And I think he will have a good shot I think he's going to qualify better than he has at the last two races. He's had two more weeks to get more healed up. You saw the focus in that kid during his recovery videos. Think about where he's at now. I think he's going to be right behind Alonso. I think he's going to get around those Mercedes and get around the Ferraris. And I think he's going to get his first podium in quite a while. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with not maybe maybe not this race, but I definitely see Stroll being on a podium this year. As crazy as that sounds, and as much fun as I've made of that guy, and how much I just can't stand his like deadpan look. I just can't stand his face sometimes. But I know, he very looks. <laughs> he, he's got that look on his face like m- my dad wouldn't like that. Yeah, he's got a very punchable <laughs> face. But I think he gets a that car is good, and he he had just some bad luck. I mean, he was going to get fourth place last week. Without a doubt, I think he he was going to be P4 last week. And he just had some bad luck. So I think he does get a podium eventually. But I don't know about this soon. But who knows? Lewis, he had eight poles here. And he has only won twice in Australia. So poles don't mean wins in Australia. No, not necessarily. And that's 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 really true at the last few races we've talked about. So we'll, uh, we'll just have to see what happens. Any more thoughts about the Australian Grand Prix as we gear up for round three, my friend? Not really. I'm just hoping for a really exciting race. We deserve it. We deserve a better race. I think everybody does after everything that we've had to go through with the FIA lately and at least the last race. Hopefully there's no blunders. Hopefully it's sunny skies in Australia and we we just get a fun race. I think with four DRS zones, we're going to see a lot more competitive racing in the mid-pack with Mercedes, Ferrari, and maybe even those Aston Martins, depending on how hooked up they are in the straights. So I think it's going to be much better than the streets of Saudi Arabia. I do think McLaren and Williams will be in points this week. I know that, that sounds crazy. Nice. At least one of them. One of them will get, I, I believe one of them will be in the points this week. I don't know if both, it would be cool if both, but that means a lot of stuff has to shake up at the top of the field. But I think McLaren or Williams, Williams has a lot of speed. They, they kind of showed some speed last week. So I, I think one of those two get That's some a bold points prediction. this week. There's your bold, bold. prediction, Caleb. There's my bold prediction. Put that in there. Because like we said, there's only a couple of point paying positions after you get Red Bull, Aston Martin, Mercedes, and Ferrari. There's eight right there. If, if all those guys have a good race, that leaves you three points to play for yep that's going to mean a lot at the end of the season well thanks guys for listening to our australian grand prix predictions make sure to check us out on youtube follow us wherever you listen to the podcasts check us out on social media we'll see you after round three